This video is sponsored by the Ridge Wallet. In the late 1950s, there were rumors of a radical new aircraft design from deep within the USSR. It would be a flying boat that could fly vertically, carried the biggest nuclear weapon the Soviets could muster, and had its own parasite fighter capable of scouting defense and independent strikes. This flying monster could land anywhere, from water to desert to snow and ice, and would be refueled from submarines in remote lagoons and lakes, all with only a crew of three and a range to reach the distant shores of the United States. But this incredible concept from an even more incredible engineer never happened, and the USSR passed on what could have turned the tide of nuclear fever. Welcome to the most overkill bomber aircraft ever designed, the Bartini A57. Oh, what's this? A passenger plane piloted by cute puppy dogs and carrying candy for all of us? Oh no, that kitty fighter jet behind it's got it target locked. He's going to shoot it down. Unless one of you people that hasn't subscribed to the channel clicks that red button right now in three, two, one. Thank goodness, someone saved the day. Anyway, back onto the show. By the late 1950s, the Cold War was at full thrust, pitching the military might and the scientific minds of the United States and the Soviet Union against each other. The arms race between the two superpowers was at fever pitch, and it looked like things might be heating up very soon. The atomic age was well into its maturity, and both countries were frantically developing new and horrible ways in which to deliver intercontinental ballistic missiles or nuclear payloads. The Bartini A-57 was one such project by the USSR. Envisaged was a massive sea-launched intercontinental bomber that wouldn't need to take off from land-based airfields, which were always much more vulnerable to enemy attacks and reconnaissance. How the Bartini A-57 bomber was designed to achieve this was inventive to say the least. The way in which it would take off and how it would be fueled were just two of the innovations devised by the A-57 concept. And there's a good reason why the Bartini A-57 has been dubbed a beast of an aircraft, given that it was technically a flying boat. Let's dive right in, shall we? First things first, the A-57 was designed in 1957 and would have hauled a 244N thermonuclear bomb on board. That is very important for the time, given that 1957 was slap bang in the middle of the hyper-paranoid atomic age and escalating arms race. Even though it was a large bomber carrying a city-destroying nuke, it would have only needed a crew of three. The A-57 would weigh in at 320 tons or 705 pounds, have a length of 69.5 meters or 228 feet, and a total wing area of 755 square meters or 8,127 square feet. Importantly, although designed to avoid land-based airfields, the A-57 was indeed equipped with skids for aircraft landings if it needed. The aerodynamic configuration of the A-57 was quite revolutionary for its time, particularly with regards to its long-swept wings. The leading edge of the wing had a sweep angle which became stepped, thereby simplifying the wing's load-bearing surface. It also created what is called a self-balancing wing. This feature of its wings enhanced the aerodynamic capabilities of the aircraft, allowing it to reach subsonic and supersonic speeds with relative ease, especially for a large flying boat bomber of that era. This design of the wing would later be known as the Bartini wing. For takeoff from water, the aircraft was also fitted with a ski chassis consisting of hydro skis and underwater wings. The landing gear not only allowed the A57 to land on and take off from both water and the ground, but also from snow and ice. 
It is believed that the A57 could take off from any unpaved airfield with a runway not less than 3,000 meters or 9,500 feet long, as well as a smooth, snow-covered strip with a length of 3,600 meters or nearly 12,000 feet without using its accelerators. So as you can see, this plane really was designed to take off from anywhere at any time. On that last point, it's worth noting that this ability to take off from snow and ice would have also made it possible to use forward-based airfields on drifting ice falls located in the Arctic region or even icebergs that drifted south down into the Atlantic Ocean. The larger version of this aircraft was called the America, and that's with a K, and hence the A designation in the A-57, as its intended target was obviously the United States. A smaller short-range flying boat was also designed which could reach targets in Europe that were closer to the Soviet Union's borders, and it was named the Ye-57, with the Ye derived from the Russian word for Europe, which is Europa. Let's explore what a typical mission would involve with the A-57. As stated in the video by my handsome voice not less than 30 seconds ago, one of the innovations of the A-57 was the way in which it would take off. It would achieve this with the use of vertical jets for needed thrust and lift. Highly economical and powerful turbojet lift engines were significant features of this aircraft given its size and bulkiness as a massive boat plane. The engine technology would be similar to that found on a vertical takeoff or landing or veto aircraft today. A lift jet is angled to provide an aircraft with an aerostatic lift instead of relying on pure or additional thrust for the aircraft to take off. That means it's an engine that doesn't require the movement of the air over the airfoil to generate lift and hence is able to take off vertically when needed. The engines were logically positioned to face downward in order to assist its takeoff from water surfaces. The chosen engine was to be the NK-10B, or the P-10-B engine, which boasted an afterburner thrust of just 24,000 kilograms, or 52,000 pounds. With five such engines on board, the A-57 should have been able to fly at a cruising speed of 2,500 kilometers per hour, with a climbing height of 24,000 meters. Its maximum takeoff weight would have lied somewhere between 270 and 305 tons. The aircraft could take on a significant amount of fuel as well as its nuclear weapons to cover huge distances. So you're probably wondering, why on earth was this plane designed? Speaking of design, we can't help but mention how poorly designed people's wallets are, and it's time that there was another way to carry your cards and cash. I am of course talking about today's video sponsor, the Ridge Wallet. They're kind of like the arrival of jet aircraft in World War II, totally game changing. The Ridge Wallet can hold over 12 cards plus room for cash, has super durable construction and fits snugly in my hand. Compared to my bulky phone case, it's a world of difference and I know which one I'll be rocking from now on. To get your own and 10% off, use the link in the description ridge.com slash FNE. It's risk free for 45 days with returns for a full refund if it's not for you. Anyway, back to the show. As ambitious and perhaps even foolhardly as the A57 project sounded, there was relatively sound rationale for it conceptually. Well, at least if one considers what the aircraft designer, Robert Bartini, had to say. Bartini was of the opinion that there were key problems or challenges, if you like, that face strategic aviation, meaning that any military aircraft should deliver on the following. One, it should be able to penetrate any point of the enemy's territory. Two, it should provide the least vulnerability possible from an enemy's air defense systems. Three, it should remain as hidden as possible before reaching or attacking its target. Four, it should be able to approach from any tactical advantageous area such as snow, ice, ground or water. 
and five, it should be independent of stationary runways and launching grounds that are costly and leave military assets exposed. Bartini made some very good points in his estimation of what is needed for an ideal military aircraft. And in his mind, the A-57 came closest to achieving the objectives needed to overcome that list of challenges. In particular, the A-57 would be perfect for achieving its fifth challenge, namely ensuring that fixed, land-based runways could be avoided, if not obsolete. But what of that little fighter jet that we have seen so far in all these 3D renders? Later variations of the A-57 design also incorporated a twin-engine jet known as a parasite fighter that would serve as the escort and reconnaissance mate for the much larger bomber when doing sorties over enemy territory. This fighter jet, called the, and forgive me here in my pronunciation, the Saibin 2RS, which would later become the RSR, would be able to piggyback the A57, traveling at its top speed of 2,500 kilometers per hour or 1,500 miles per hour. Together, the two aircraft could cover targets within a radius of 5,000 kilometers or a 3,107 mile radius. Interestingly, the Saibin 2RS baby jet would only need to use its fuel on its return flight. And by the way, it's worth noting that whilst the Bartini A57 was always a conceptual plane, the smaller Saibin 2RS fighter jet did in fact already exist at the time. Also, an interesting aspect of the later RSR reconnaissance aircraft was that its dimensions and weight were very similar to that of a cruise missile. Which of course, was not by chance. Had it actually gone into development, we might have seen this plane carry or be a launching platform for bigger missiles or perhaps even something to reach orbit. But we ain't done yet, because what they designed next was even more insane. Perhaps a more ambitious innovation for this bomber would be its refueling system. The plan, of course, was for it to be refueled by submarines. Yeah, you heard that right. Refueling this massive bomber would only be done by submarines out at sea. Commentators have noted that flying boats, which is essentially what the A-57 bomber was, are not made for waves and require flat, shallow water on which to land and maneuver. The best places for them to do this is rivers, bays or lagoons. Submarines, on the other hand, are the exact opposite. They hate shallow water and operating in relatively confined spaces such as rivers, bays or lagoons, which makes them potentially more at risk of attack. Which begs the question, who thought it was a great idea to have a giant boat plane that was fueled from submarines? Well, that man was obviously his designer, Robert Bartini. It's worth spending a bit of time to discuss who exactly this man that the plane was named after. Namely, Robert Ludwigovic Bartini. He was originally from Italy, having been born from a noble Italian family. In his time, he would go to become a pioneer of amphibious aircraft and ground effect vehicles. The Soviets nicknamed him Baron Rosso, or the Red Baron, due to his noble descent. He had a long been a member of the Italian Communist Party and fled to Moscow when Mussolini's fascists took over in Italy in 1922. He received Soviet citizenship and worked for the Central Design Bureau building seaplanes and would become the head of the Department for Amphibious Experimental Aircraft Designs in Moscow. Unfortunately for himself, Bartini was in the habit of criticizing some of the policies and the leadership of the Soviet Union, and in 1938, he was arrested by the country's notorious secret police, or NKVD, on the ludicrous charge of being a spy for fascist Italy, the exact country that he ran away from. 
He would go on to receive a 10-year prison sentence, although he continued to work on new aircraft designs throughout World War II. Released from prison in 1946, he would only be officially rehabilitated by the Soviet state by the direct orders of the Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev himself. He would eventually be awarded the Order of Lenin in 1967. He published numerous papers regarding aviation construction materials technology, aerodynamics, flight dynamics, and even theoretical physics. Bartini's effect, a phenomenon in aerodynamics where the drag is reduced and thrust increased when an aircraft propellers are arranged with two motors in tandem, was named in honor of Bartini himself as he was the first designer to propose it. Bartini designed 60 different aircraft during his lifetime, yet only a few were actually built. Today, it's acknowledged that many of Bartini's designs and engineering ideas were simply too ahead of their time. Yet his much vaulted A-57 bomber was not to be, even though on paper, it sounded pretty fantastic. Why? There was a change of fortunes for aviation manufacturers in the USSR as the 1960s approached. Quite drastically and almost overnight, much of the focus of the country's military innovation switched from the armed forces to the manufacture of rocket technology. The successful launch of Sputnik 1, the world's first satellite in orbit in space, in October 1957 had stoked up the Soviet leadership with patriotic fever. The atomic age was making way for the space age, and the Soviets were increasingly spurred on by the challenge of beating the Americans out in space. The Kremlin had also realized that the development of ICBMs did not require the need for massive, hugely expensive bombers such as the Bartini A-57. Those ballistic missile payloads could be far more efficiently delivered than that as the 1960s quickly revealed. The good news is, is that not all work that went into the A-57 was wasted. A little project known as the design and development of the Tupolev Tu-144 supersonic passenger aircraft, what would be the Soviet Union's answer to the Concorde supersonic jet, took off into the sky in 1960s, pun intended. And it's well known that all of the documentation relating to the 1950s A-57 bomber project was sent to Tupolev by Moscow. Bartini's ingenious ideas would yet be put into groundbreaking effect. It seems fitting for an acclaimed engineer who spoke seven languages and was also an astronomer, philosopher, physicist, painter and musician. Bartini was the quintessential modern renaissance man and he joins a long line of other aviation heroes that create the modern world we have today. Also, special thanks to Paper Skies who suggested this topic today. I'm glad to be surrounded by other aviation channels that are not only inspirational, but suggest such captivating ideas. I like to think that we're all one big happy family, and like the aviators of old, helping each other makes for a better world. At least, a better YouTube. And if you want to also join the family, then I suggest becoming a subscriber today. And if you really want to contribute, then we also have a Patreon and channel memberships. You get to see videos early and also chat with me on Discord. So come and join and suggest a few topics.